Today's features as writers and performers offer awakening words of soul-stirring emotion, some out-of-the-box, perhaps even out-of-this-world philosophizing, as well as some downright funny observations about life. And I'd like to begin with Trisha Knudsen. Trisha is from Northboro. She's a poet and a singer, and she's featured at concerts and open mics throughout New England. She was born in Syracuse, New York, and grew up with her parents and two brothers. And when her youngest brother was born, he was born with multiple developmental special needs. And at 16, at that time, Trisha turned to writing as catharsis and escape. And she's been writing ever since. Trisha had dreams of becoming a chef and was accepted into the CIA. Now that's the Culinary Institute of America, not the spy thing. <laughs> However, she changed her mind and her dreams after having a religious epiphany, and she went into a vocation of teaching special education instead. Trisha has also worked in drug manufacturing and research and as a magazine editor, and she's currently director of operations for a nonprofit organization. Trisha and her husband, Phil, have been married 26 years after meeting on a blind date, and they have raised two children, Daniel and Kelly, who are now in their 20s, and they are still caring for one at home being a life-loving, hyperactive Bernays mountain dog named Feeney. Trisha and Phil co-host an open mic at the Center for the Arts in Natick, and Trisha is currently working on her first book of poetry, and we look forward to its release. And when introducing her poetry, Trisha said that she sends out this message, that I hope something in my work speaks right to your heart. And here she is to share some of that with you. Please help me welcome Trisha Knudsen. Before I met you and a long time ago, I lived a life uncommon to most. It caused me to grow up fast with only one dream, the dream to find myself entirely away from the place I had been raised. It took a good amount of time, though I was still a child when I embarked upon the oft-times rocky journey that has led me here. Tediously, blessedly normal things followed school and courting, marriage and children, cats and birds and rabbits and dogs and jobs and jobs and jobs. And there were not so blessed, not so normal things, pain and pills, hospitals and failed medications, the five or is it six stages of grief cycling my brain ad nauseum. Stable now of mind and body, nothing and everything strikes me as extraordinary waking up, swinging both legs over the side of the bed, putting both feet solidly on the floor. A happy family, loving friends, a smile for strangers. These are my accolades. And now I find myself on the brink of 50, that old dream expired and sent to the dust. New dreams arriving even as we meet. Dreams I hope someday to share though owning them for myself is the true capture, the true prize. Happy spring. Thank you all for coming out. Thank you to Cheryl. I appreciate that you're all here to share the morning with Sam and David and I. And I thank the HCAM crew, Mike and Casey and Karen, for providing this opportunity for local artists and musicians to be heard. I write from the space I dwell in. That space occupies a section of my brain roughly akin to the attic, somewhat dusty and disorganized, and a section of my heart divided as it is by the various concerns of life. So it's reasonable to say that I live the better part of my days in my head, but I think with my heart. <clears throat> What I find wonderful about the world and those things I struggle to understand may be different for you, but that life is both beautiful and messy is universally mutual. I think we're here to help one another sort it all out. 
and I try to give back as I've been given by writing it all down. I hope what I've chosen to share today touches your heart. I offer it as a gift. I wrote this poem yesterday. I wasn't going to read it, but it's been begging me. It's called Circus. We do not own our words. They fly through us like acrobats on a trapeze, landing above us on the high wire, just out of reach, until they choose to fall into our waiting nets below. We capture them then and lay them down static on the page, afraid of their movements, worried that they'll jump from the lines and rosin up their little feet to set their grip and start climbing again, while we fumble like clowns spilling out of a tiny car chasing after them with lassoes and buckets of confetti. These next few poems are for my family. <clears throat> this happens to be Phil's favorite. Yesterday they hung there, plaid and blue on the bathroom peg, sleeve to leg entwined. Today apart they lay, worn and tossed away, waiting out of mind. Tonight, when needs again arise for flannel soft and warm, together they will lie, enfolding you and I. At 17, for Daniel. At 17, his birthday just a day ago, this bright, happy son of mine takes the big blue tarp he's raking leaves onto and makes of it a cape. I'm flying! I'm flying! He cries as he runs through the yard with wild-eyed abandon. My boy returned, and mostly, I think, for my pleasure, and gratefully, I think, for my memories. Callie, my zoo. She bounds through life, trumping as she goes, her golden mane tangling behind, all lanky limbs and flash of teeth, twining all the while around the hearts of those she seeks to charm, stalking sinew taut against the chill, I pray, cruel fallen world, eater of man's dreams, do not break her will. The rest of the poems I'm reading today were written as I've traveled through life to trying to sort it all out. I write as catharsis, as Cheryl said. The good and evil sides of my psyche continue to battle it out for domination. But despite their best efforts, each lends balance and warning perspective and wonder. <laughs> These first three reflect my feisty side. The first one is called Take Note. It's easy to say let go, give in, give up, let God. Harder to see that life is full of miracles, that hope lives in every tiny seed, every fledgling ready to take wing. There is such a place in the human heart a place which yearns for, wonders about, expects possibility. I'm living here, take note. If tomorrow says this fire causes pain, I'll stand outside with hope and wait for quench of rain. Caution to the wind. I throw caution to the wind Watch as bits of the stuff that fear is made of unravel from its core, floating up to meet the budding branches, catching in them, waving like little flaglets. Here we are, here we are, daring me in my timid skin to run at them with safety nets, to recapture what was freed, to lock it down again, force it back to the dark recesses where it lies safe and unattended. But I'm gladdened by the beauty of their wavering pulse, Happy to know that some part of what makes me afraid has been loosed to fly beyond my careful reach, free as a whim, as far as my dreams, and so I do not run. Please call me David. All he has ever done lives in me in thought and deed. We are the same share the same mindset, have the same inclination toward evil. His crimes are my ponderings, his lusts my appetites. Yet I am like him too in this. I have this hope, undying, 
eternal, that he who made me loves me, carries me up and out and over the muck I continually fall into, releases me from this bondage merely because, like David, I have enough faith to pick up one little stone after another and aim. I chose this next group of poems because they've advised me and helped me decipher some of the puzzles of life. This first one is called Filling Holes. Finding a hole can be a revelation. In fact, a hole often lies dormant and undiscovered until we find ourselves trying to fill it. It may have become weedy and overgrown out of apathy or neglect until it is inadvertently uncovered and reveals itself to be a tender place, protected by the ignorance of its existence. Or perhaps it betrays itself by allowing an unwary misstep or lying in wait for the accidental stumble after which it is seen as a hazard which must be tended to. This need to fill can be a dangerous proposition. One must have the right materials and tools to make the job permanent and not just a temporary patch. Sorting out the reasons holes exist gives the clearest clues as to their mending. Filling holes for the sake of their removal without this knowledge almost always causes a turn of the ankle, a rip in the flesh, a face or two in the dirt. I titled this one Geppetto, if you know anything about Disney. <laughs> oh, great poopenspieler, yank my strings. <laughs> Behind the backdrop, give me wings. Dance me across the platform bare and set me in the little chair. Drop my jaw and let me speak. Paint a tear upon my cheek. Place me on my wooden knee and draw my hands to you in plea for mercy, mercy as I kneel. I bow a humble poopin, spielt. For if I were a real child, I doubt that I should be so mild. I doubt my strings would find your hand. Ah, oh, wouldn't such a life be grand? Instead of steps both frail and weak, a strident air is what I'd seek not fraught with nagging doubt or pain, and no one over me to reign, and only me to know those things I wrongly do that beg for strings. <clears throat> this one is called Not All Who Wander. Who really knows the path we walk unless they feel the same sharp stones inside their shoes? the ones that fit a little different for each foot, the left closer to the heart's first offerings, a bit tighter for the privilege. Who can say that choosing to walk on a slant forward with a sort of bounce on the ball before slapping the hard pavement heel touching last is any less effective than the pinched model glide or the bride's step shuffle step or the farmer's weighty time-worn thunk of boot on door sill at the end of a long day of row after row after row. Each his own way must wander and each his own curved arc must follow until at last he knows in his heart that first step to last his circle draws close and completes itself meeting prints long erased and deeper hidden than when his journey he dared to begin. If it were for us to know which way and when, how sad and dull an adventure it would be. Take heart, you weary, muddled travelers, and know that there is aught worth finding when all the days are sunshine. Be brave and boldly set out when shadows are casting long before you, with hope that you will discover something true of your character upon rounding that next bend. Forge up the mountain, dwell in safety among the whispers of brook walk, brook water over rock. Pay attention to what the wind is telling you and where the wee birds roost at close of day. This final group of three I chose as poems of resolution. I'm honored to say that two of my poems have been made into songs. The first one you heard from Phil. The second was 
put to music by my dear friend John Bamer, who's here today. It's called Dirt. For Bishy. We are all made of earth, formed by the hand of God from the dirt of the ground and holy breath. We have a share in the genesis of creation. Everything made thus can claim this as truth. Dirt nurtures the planted seeds of life. They thrive with sun and water to take their place amid all growing things. It is their sustenance by grace. Dirt gets a bad name from those who would use it for purposes of slander, but it is truly a part of our collective history. Everyone is made of it. It is our nature. There is only one who can claim otherwise, and it is not me, and it is not you. So stand as you have been planted and trust that you are still growing straight and true. Breathe the sweet air with the sun on your face and let the rain wet your skin and seep into your heart to wash away your fears. Count it good that by mercy, the dirt we begin as is transformed from earth to body and body to mind and mind to soul and soul to spirit and spirit to heart and heart to love. Be glad, dear one, that you are made of dirt. <clears throat> one such day. Fact is, we all live every day with our fears and hopes and dreams. We all pray our way through those damnable patterns and our natures follow us along. But there are moments, fleeting though they seem, which define our character which make us feel that we are worthy to continue to breathe the air with our fellows. This, for me, is one such day. Now, I didn't get here by myself, no. Left to my own, I'm the master of misalignment, the queen of conundrum. I need the bits and pieces of advice from those that love me, those that I love and trust and admire for their effort and hopefulness and character and faith in what goodness may be found in me. I need them like breath, like food, like peace. And I'm grateful beyond telling that they're with me everywhere I roam, offering potential and freedom and hope, always hope. Hope is my mantra. The love of friends is my sustenance. And I appreciate all of you for coming, for your generous and kind attention. And I leave you with this. Touchstones. We're all just feeling our way along the wall in the dark. Some of us trying so hard to get back to the comfortable. Not afraid, really. Just not ready for the risking of it all. Some of us trapped in a room with four walls and those memories which cloy and attend us like nursemaids when all we want to find is the door. We all need our touchstones, the knowing look from a caring friend, the soothing voice of the one we love, the warm, milky smell of a newborn child all calling us home, back to where we're safe, back to the place that holds us and whispers, all will be well. I thank you very much. Next for our feature today, we have David McPherson here. David comes from Worcester, Massachusetts, and he's a spoken word performer and writer. He grew up in Naperville, Illinois, and Nyack, New York. He began writing poems 10 years ago. Um, and David has been going to open mics, which he believes has pushed him to both write and perform. David is a highly respected poet and writer who has performed across New England, and he is published in a number of poetry journals and publications. He lives with his wife, poet Heather McPherson, and his seven-month-old poet son, George, <laughs> who's with us here today in the back. I think he's reading Shakespeare. <laughs> Please help me welcome David McPherson. 
She dances on the lip of the stage to the men below her. The blue follow spotlight hits her and her skin becomes the turquoise of a Caribbean reef. The men with their dollar bills pointing can almost hear the crash of the wave and smell the salt water foaming on their brows. She does not see them. She is motion and light. She transcends the beer stains and the cigarette butts. Her thoughts are her own as she is bathed in a blue light. He pulls his car over to the side of the road, curses as he pulls it, puts it into park, takes out his license and registration. The flashing light illuminates the glove compartment. Any minute now, the trooper is going to come out of that car and ask for his license, try to smell the scotch and sodas he had at TJ's. Where was his breath mints? He'd be fine right now if he had his breath mints. The trooper still has not left his car, but he will soon. And with a casual tone, alter everything as he is bathed in a blue light. So they hit me with this brat blue beam right before they transported me to the mothership. <laughs> I was taking out the trash like I do every Wednesday when this light encircled me. I don't know what they wanted. I still don't. I mean, they didn't treat me particularly well. They, uh, there's no polite way. They probed me. I don't understand these yahoos who are like waiting for the mothership's return. I'm happy for them to stay where they are. But I got to tell you, in that first moment, I thought it was beautiful. I thought I was beautiful. I thought that I was going to be permitted to change. In that first flash, when I was bathed in a blue light. When I was a kid, I wanted a girl with, who listened to Miles Davis LPs. She would have raven black hair, iron flat, have tight black turtleneck sweaters, and be thin like Twiggy or some Andy Warhol factory girl who was actually a girl. She'd have dangling silver earrings that would ring like chimes every time she'd shake her head no, but how often would that be, really? <laughs> She'd work in the city at an advertising firm or publishing and have her own flat. Not an apartment, but a flat like a British chicken. Oh, she would be British. And find me in my provincial ways delightfully colonial. She'd be going to a psychotherapist trained with Freud or Young down in his office in Greenwich Village. She would have a large makeup table filled with all the eyeshadow and lipstick she could ever want, but usually went out preferring the natural look. And we would lounge at her flat on the asymmetrical pillows thrown on the floor and smoke clothes clove cigarettes and hand-rolled while we contemplated her op art paintings. And Miles Davis would be on the stereophonic hi-fi with white spaceship-shaped speakers, album after album stacked on the automatic changer so it could run all night. And when it was time for bed, we would go crawl into her Swedish futon. All of it was key, but the most important part was Miles Davis LPs and her love for them. Sketches of Spain, Birth of the Cool, brew, sharp albums and even sharper album sleeves, and she would carry in front of her chest her arms cradling it like a child so the world could see that she was a girl who listened to Miles Davis, and you knew right away what was spinning at her listening parties. Most of my teen years, I was at the town record store hoping that she, she, whoever she was, would find the nerve to go to the jazz deck section and pick up milestones or in a silent way or anything Miles Davis-y and take it to the listening booth in the back of the shop. And me loitering there, I had a perfect line ready that would ensure me to be invited into that booth. Don't ask. I don't remember what it was. I'm sure it was lame. But I never got the chance to find out. I never spotted her there. My town was that kind of no nothing burg where the girls couldn't appreciate good music like Miles Davis. Truth to tell, me neither. Jazz bores the hell out of me. <laughs> But that was the girl I wanted all the same. She could teach me, talk all night about bebop, atonal, freeform, and I could play real music in my head like the Dave Clark Five or the Monkees. Hey, they were actually pretty damn good. Nothing prefab. You could hear for yourself if you don't believe me. Best of the Monkees is on the jukebox. I got to put in. The owner here is a buddy of mine. He lets me pick a few CDs for the juke. 
I even had him put in a Miles Davis. Someday my prince will come. No one plays it. Ever. But whenever I see some skinny girl with long, straight, dark hair walk over with her dollar to pick some tunes, I hold my breath, waiting, hoping that she has better taste than me and has her own flat. Not an apartment, always a flat. <laughs> Thanks. How you guys doing? Um, Quick announcement, well not announcements, but I just want to thank, uh, thank Cheryl for uh, inviting me. This is, I've always been impressed with the poets here and the, 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 uh, the musicians. Um, I do have uh, some chapbooks for sale. Um, all the money that I get will be going, my wife has a wonderful um, poetry journal called Ballastry Poetry Journal and um, all the money will be going to getting the next issue out which would be soon. If you're interested in that information, uh, you can uh, get in touch with, uh, with Heather or you can get in touch with me. Um, uh, the best way to reach me is my email, davemacp at aol.com. So just, you know, drop a line and we can let you know about the, the, the journal. <sighs> Twenty or so things about a guy named Phil Oakes. Phil Oakes was a folk singer in the 1960s. Phil Oakes killed himself at 35 years of age, which is how old I was when I wrote this. He stopped writing new songs at least five years before he died. He hung himself in his sister's bathroom. His nephew found him. I found him at the record collection of my uncle, former uncle. Now that my aunt divorced him, he is the male role model of my youth I have tried to expunge. Phil Oakes was an alcoholic and treated his women poorly. Phil Oakes, by the end, gained weight and a gun fetish. He changed his performing name to John Train. On a trip to Africa, he was attacked and his vocal cords were damaged. He wrote songs like, I ain't marching anymore, changes, pleasures of the harbor. He was Jewish and had his nose done when he was 18. I am Jewish, but never had the type of nose that would make me want to have surgery. He supported Cesar Chavez through a large rally for him. Bob Dylan showed up. He wrote a song called No More Songs. The drums are in the dawn and all the voices gone, and it seems that there are no more songs. His brother, Michael Oakes, has the largest photo archive of rock and roll pictures in the world. Sean Penn was going to write, direct, and star in a movie about Phil Oakes. I guess the movie was not made, or at least I just stopped looking for it. I accidentally threw away all my Phil Oaks CDs five years ago. I have not found time to replace them. It is almost too easy to say that he died because he couldn't write anymore. All his biographers say that it is so, but that does not mean it is true. I sometimes think about Phil Oaks' nephew, the one who found him, the remains. I hope he's okay. I have been in the audience at poetry readings and songwriting open mics where the poet brings up an obscure, forgotten singer or writer and acts as if we should know who he is. Or if we don't, we should feel ashamed of our ignorance. I'm not doing that. I don't care if you know who Phil Oaks is. Because what if I'm making him up? What if I just got him out of the air? I mean... What if everything I wrote here, said here, is a fiction, a lie, though we do not call these things lies because folk poets and folk singers only speak truth? But what if the person who I have just been talking of is a thing of my own imagination? You never heard him. You can't hum along to his greatest hits. He might as well be a character created just now, right here, for your benefit. Would you feel betrayed? Would you be angry at me? Would you want to stand up, come right here, and slap me in the face? And could you still feel sympathy for his nephew, the one who found him? All right, two more. And thank you so much. Actually, a really short one. This is a part of a series called Costume Crime Fighters. Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman watches the business lady's kids. Don't ask her what the kids' names are. The names are ridiculous. Unpleasant to the tongue. Courtney, Ashley, Adrian. Poisonous and numbing. When the business lady is out of earshot, she bestows them with proud Amazonian names. The names of goddesses. She sings them lullabies stolen from her mother. 
She wipes their mouths, their behinds. She folds the pants and bibs. She vacuums the crumbs, sponges the throw up. She sits with the kids in the front room. She tells them, look out, look outside. My airplane is parked in the yard. The kids shout, where, where? We don't see any airplane. Wonder Woman says, it's right there. You can't see it because it's invisible. The children squeal, clap their hands as if this was a game. All right. Actually, I'm going to end with a relatively longer piece. I, once again, thank you for allowing me to be here. Well, sir. One day, Father Death and Father Life were walking hand in hand down the streets of the city. What city? Well, sir, it was all cities all at once. It was London. It was, it was Khartoum. It was Budapest. It was New Haven, Connecticut. Father Death and Father Life can do that kind of thing. And these two old gentlemen have spent many a lovely afternoon strolling together. But not recently. Work had been busy for both. The population boom completely exhausted Father Life. His hair turned gray and fell out completely. Father Death fared no better. With all the wars and diseases, his skin was now weathered like a rock face battered by the waves. So this was the first time they were out and about for quite some time. Father Life looked around the thoroughfare at all the faces, pulses, buzzing rhythms, and was filled with great pride. He turned to Father Death and said, What do you say, old friend, these eyes, these breathing mouths, this throng of life? I would never say anything about you, but everywhere I go, I am greeted with the jubilation of existence. And Father Death chuckled and said, Well, maybe that's so. Well, sir, these two distinguished old men found themselves leaving the brightly lit storefronts and boulevards and into the shadowy, uneven streets that surround the commercial district. Outstretched hands dressed in tattered rags came out from crouching corners. People walked with lowered eyes, coughing into the air. Many asked for alms, for coins, for a little something for coffee. Father Death reached into his pockets and gave to everyone who asked he had large pockets. They were filled with forgotten money, gold fillings, shawls for warmth, pennies off a dead man's eyes. His pockets were surely bountiful. But Father Life reached into his pockets and found them bare. They were filled with promise, hope, growing potential, but nothing of substance, only a little lint. And the sickly came to them, and Father Life was ashamed. He could not find words for them. His tongue was hollow. But Father Death smiled and laughed and touched them with kindness. He gave them words to warm themselves, like, not for a while. You have time. Or, you need to fight. There is fight in you still. I will not come for you until I have seen that you have fought. And to a few, he would just say, soon. I will come for you soon. And as these things happened, Father Death and Father Life were on the boardwalk by the river. Well, sir, Father Life was despondent and would not say a word for quite a while. Finally, he looked at his companion and said, what good am I? I give life, but I can't help the needy. I have no comfort for the sick. Only in your palms is there any peace. Only in death is there any solace. Father Death laughed. He said, solace in me. I suppose there is. I am where the story ends, yes, but the excitement comes from you. Only in experiencing what life offers will they come to me with appreciation. I might be the final comfort, but you are all the simple joys. You are midnight kisses. You are light summer rain and birthday presents. You are home runs and pirouettes. You are crayon portraits, sad poems and merengue music. You are ripe tomatoes and leaps of faith. Every story must end in me, but you make the, the tale colorful. You give it soul. No one would want to come to me if you did not fill them with the sights and sounds of this mad carnival. After a day at this parade, with full of frights and thrills, everyone returns home, ready for sleep, but filled with the knowledge that they have quite, had quite a fine day. Do not feel sad, for we are the mouth and the tail of the serpent eating itself. And Father Death took Father Life's face in his old hands, brought him to his lips, where they kissed by the running water and kissed again. And for one second, all of existence held its breath in a moment of unexpected harmony.
And that's what happened. Or at least, that's what I was told. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have Sam Bayer with us. Sam is a Boston musician, singer-songwriter, and I'd like to share a little quote from the press about Sam. He is a literate, exuberant guide to an imaginary world where housewives win the Nobel Prize in physics, poker-playing children gamble over their bedtimes, and metaphorical elephants pirouette in the den four and a half minutes at a time. Sam grew up in Cleveland Heights, Ohio, where he said he specialized in hiding in his room as a child. He wrote his first song at 15, and later on he attended a songwriting workshop in England in 1994, which was taught by Ray Davies of the Kinks. And Sam met a number of amazingly talented people at the workshop there that he's still in touch with. As a songwriter, Sam says that he's inspired by his mother, who was poet Deanne Bayer, as well as his friends and the random events of the world. He said that one of his funniest moments performing his songs, which began at age 24, was when he got his own name wrong while he was introducing himself. <laughs> and one of the best moments and memories when he was asked about that what Sam said is every single time that I get on stage. So I'm here to share some of that with us this morning. Please help me welcome Sam Baer. My mother died of cancer in 2006. And um, she was a poet. She was a fine, fine, fine poet. Uh, I've, of the many things that she did in her life, that was one of the things that was most meaningful to her, and I think most meaningful to, the, to um, me and to her colleagues. Uh, she was active in the uh, poetry forum in, in Cleveland Heights, in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, had a number of, uh, a number of, of admirers who, who uh, encouraged me to put together a volume of her poetry after she died. And this is the volume of poetry. It's called The Diamond of Your Name. Uh, you can download it. It's a free PDF. Uh, there are flyers in the back of the room if you enjoy what you hear. Um, I'd like to thank um, my wife and uh, Trish Knudsen as well for uh, helping me select the poems that, were going, that went into this uh, volume. So without further ado, we will start with one of my m mother's favorite topics. Uh, the onset of winter. This is called Exemplars. And I apologize, you're going to see a lot of my bald spot today because these are my mother's poetry, poems, not mine. November. Winter's chill seizes the morning. Maple's metal leafs the lawn. Stalks once stems bleach to beige and blackberry bushes rival the ruby rust of oaks. So much for summer's emerald dominion. While warmth still tints afternoon, I uproot vegetable plants no longer bearing, cut down withering foliage of perennial blooms, but not as death with his scythe, the shoots will spring upwards again. To find those few flowers low to the ground have escaped the percussion of autumn winds, white alyssum fringing the driveway like moltings from wayward angels, lobelia deepening its purple in rebellion against doomsday cold, and tall in the scarring arms of the Iron Maiden Rosebush, one stubborn, lustered calendula. The Last Picnic. I knew very little about my mother's love life for obvious reasons because she was married to my father for 46 years. And um, she used to speak of, she spoke very little of the people that, that she was involved with before she met my dad. Um, one of them was a man named Arnie Soboloff. He uh, did the, uh, the plop, plop, fizz, fizz, arc seltzer commercials, for those of you who remember those. Uh, and she, every time those commercials came in, they, they were just, oh, Arnie Soboloff, I used to go out with him. Back in the days before she was a real person, as far as I was concerned. <laughs> the last picnic. Watching the sun shape your hair into a goodbye cap, I try to stall the moment. Have some more iced tea, potato salad, charred love. 
Around us, summer prints in her pre-autumn excess. I'm wearing my silk dress wild with flowers summer wouldn't recognize. Might be amused at if she weren't so preoccupied with her last fling, as I might cry if I weren't distracted by iced tea and denial. The ice has melted. The potato salad's gone. The sun has set after leaching all the flavor from the day. Pouring what little is left of the tepid liquid on twilight grass, I realize, too late, I forgot to sweeten the tea. <laughs> Tivoli. A sun-pruned old woman silhouetted in the clarifying air bent over a table crocheting straw baskets for carrying dreams, head black shawled to thwart the satyr sun from impregnating her age-retrieved virginity and casting her back to youth and heartache again, selling straw baskets to tourists, coins melted to luminosity in their hands, while the reconstituted virgin smiled, grateful to be old and crocheting baskets for someone else's dreams. Because the chestnut straw matched my hair, you bought me a half-finished basket you promised you'd finish yourself. The basket rests unfinished on my table in the gelded northern sun, along with a baddocker for a trip we never took to Australia, an unpaid bill from the pensione in Tivoli, where I last saw you, drinking espresso in the late lazy afternoon garden with an anonymously sun-glassed woman I had never met, and a half-legible postcard postmarked Sorrento that I'd never have known was from you if I hadn't deciphered the words hair like the sun and a dream come true. Like me, my mother was obsessed with the passage of time. Uh, many of the poems in this volume have to do with aging and the, uh, the, the moments uh, of, of depressive reflection that, that seem to be typical of people who grew up in the Depression. To Janet. I passed the tree today, the one at the far corner where we cashed snowballs on our morning way to school all those existences ago where when not only snow but everything, future, fortune, especially dreams, was purity waiting with us, waiting for us. The tree stands still, as it did then, while you and I, aging without rings, approximate the tree bark in time-wrinkled, time-roughened skin. We are more cautious now when impersonating branches stretching outward, upward, conscious of bruises inflicted on myriad perishable leaves. We were convinced our fingers could pare the patina from the sun, from the sky. Yet here we are, earthbound, illusions melted, making do. One thing that my mother did not write about was her family. Uh, it, it's odd. We, we, when we collected her works after she passed away, we, we ended up with, uh, on the order of 600 poems perhaps, a number of which had been published. My mother had published quite uh, steadily through the later part of her life. And um, in all of those poems, I can remember only a handful that were about of anyone that she was related to. This one is about her husband. The relationship between yesterday and tonight. Recalling only middle-aged parents grizzling toward old age, my husband doesn't remember his childhood. Carrying in retrospection's biased basket, none of the regrets nor resentments nor guilt that puncture today with yesterday's barbed residues. None of the disappointments that follow childhood's quixotic illusions. His is an even nature. He never frets over what has happened or may, nor agonizes over losing imaginary jousts with should have done. With virtually no lapses for spontaneous excursions, my husband rides his equanimity and relaxing rhythm around the equator. He can't comprehend my unscheduled commuting between the poles, and he never remembers his dreams. Air for my father. I'm going to stick with the father topic for a moment. Or two. My father had a life before I was born. He'd heard Dame Myra Hess play the piano before she was a dame and splurge for a ticket up in the gods to hear the great Chalapin. My father would sing to me in his bass voice the three lines of the one Gilbert and Sullivan song he knew and had wanted to be a rabbi but couldn't afford to study, so he became a salesman instead, spending his spare time reading religion and philosophy. My father spoke often of traveling to Denver when he and Denver were young, and Denver consisted of a few straggling buildings and not much else except 
for the air, charged with a clarity that changed his seeing. And throughout my childhood, my father pumped my imagination with how pure the air in Denver was and how he longed to return someday, but he never did. I imagined the delight my father had found in the clarity of Denver's air, evoked the purity he envisioned in the rabbinate, and so I planned to go to Denver someday to live my father's dreams for him, but I never did. It's too late now. Pollution has blurred Denver's air. Clarity, purity, and my father are gone. And if my father were alive today, he'd be very disappointed in Denver. <laughs> so, uh, my father, I'm going to see my father in a few days, actually. He's, uh, my father's a part-time stamp dealer, and every year uh, since I was 12, actually, I have helped my father with an annual stamp show in Cleveland. And um, this is our bonding experience. And so after my mother died, my father called me up and he said, uh, write me a song before I'm dead. <laughs> and I am not joking, those were her, his exact words. My father is not a sentimental man. And so I thought about it, and I, I, I thought for a minute about writing a song about my father and his stamp business, but, um, you know, stamp collecting, is, it's one of those hobbies, it's very interesting to go to these stamp shows, and you stare down the aisles, it really is a race between whether the hobby will die before the people do. <laughs> it's, I mean, I'm not the youngest person there, there the, two, two booths down, every year there's a, a, a guy who's actually a stamp dealer in New Hampshire who has a a niece there who's a, a really attractive uh, young woman, and she is, of course, uh, the center of attention to all these uh, dirty old stamp collecting men. And <clears throat> <laughs> so the question was, what was I going to write about my father? And <laughs> so the thing about my father is that he is one of these people who believes, again, as a part of the uh, uh, legacy of the Depression, that. There is no point in hiring anybody else to do anything. As long as you can lift it or take it apart, you can fix it yourself. And so I thought that this was that the only th appropriate way to commemorate my, 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 my father's uh, activities was to write a song about his idiosyncratic approach to home repair. Surgery. 
trim the lawn, shim the door, clip your toenails and more with the gadgets that breathe in the silverware drawer. Your car is leaking oil, says my idiot mechanic, timing belt and alternator. Pay me now or pay me later. But when the body gets a nick, a little spackle does the trick. And I've duct taped the seat belts, and it starts with a paper clip. And it grinds and it smokes, and it's the butt of cruel jokes. And it used to be a hard top, but it works just the same. Three parts in the guyver, one part in the coop. The world is my toolbox. Managed to solve all the problems I've found with whatever's the right around. Yes, I've managed to solve all the problems I've found with whatever's been lying. Spilled milk, no sense crying. Mop it up with whatever has been lying. Next time I play that song. <laughs> Sometimes I get stuck, you know. I'm writing songs since uh, now half my life now, almost. More than half my life. Somebody once told me that in order to become a really good songwriter, you have to do it for 30 years or so. And I am now on year 32. So I have no excuse is what it comes to. But sometimes I feel like it's kind of tedious to write the songs, you know? If they could write me for a change, that would be convenient. They see me as some sort of prophet, Diogenes in his search for truth. Philosophy's answer to Superman, stepping out of his intellectual phone booth. But what the songs of right may can't see. Substance, gravity. Topics come and topics go. But the songs that write me have to write what they know. Approaches the chorus. 
But the songs that write me can't see They're obsessed with their own place history Decades come and decades go But the songs that write me Have to write what they know that write me to help me mitigate my flaws Damn the philosophy What I really need is to be more outgoing, more forthcoming in a crowd I could stand for a touch of panache a large watery the power to enchant cast spell Sometimes I ask the songs that write me to trade places with the songs that wrote Cole Porter or Jacques Brel. But the songs that write me aren't free. They're just a mirror that stares straight back at me. Uh, warned by people that I shouldn't watch myself in the monitor. <laughs> but I've gotten very distracted by it. <laughs> All right, I've got these time. The soul of brevity. I'm writing shorter poems now, peeling words. Replacing each one with rock words, brick words, not words of wood that can too easily warp so that from the beginning the walls slant and the floor sags and at the slightest breath of the wolf the roof blows away. Let's see here. Fifteen seconds of fame. A color photo on the front page, a Chechenian woman who hadn't had time to dress running with her child from Grozny and bullets and bedroom slippers and a twin of the purple bathrobe hanging in the haven of my closet. Her name is Yahira Daudava. With one hand, she's clutching her eight-year-old daughter, with the other a small bag of belongings as they flee down a dirt road, the only major road from Grozny and bullets and death. Her face is wrinkled with weeping, and the photo is so distinct I can see the fugitive hair escaping from her daughter's ponytail and the satin edge trimming our mutual bathrobe in a series of points which, if they were steel, would cut sharp as sabers. But nothing as simple as sabers threatens Yahira Dadova. Kalashnikovs are so efficient, soldiers need neither skill nor aim. No longer another anonymous refugee, now millions of people know who she is, this Yahira Dadova, who hadn't had time to dress. I will read a couple more of my mother's poems. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, my mother thanks you from beyond the grave. <laughs> you can get her book, The Diamond of Your Name, uh, a free PDF download. There are flyers in the back, as I said. My name is Sam Baer. Or actually, my name is Dick Cheney. And um, <laughs> I get that wrong all the time. I have CDs in the back for $5 and a mailing list where you can uh, get my, uh, my m approximately monthly newsletter, Sam Baer's Low Notes. Uh, where I will tell you about life and music and other things that I am thinking about. And um, maybe you can come hear me sometime. Again, that would be lovely. Thanks to the HCAM crew and to Trish. Oh, I love your poetry, Trish. And to Dave McPherson, who was just wonderfully dramatic. That was, uh, that was spectacular. I enjoyed it immensely. <sighs> to my best friend in December, my mother's best friend. 
This year, although I thought of you throughout every one of those early days in October, when sunset blazes late before lapsing into night, this year, on that dark anniversary of your death, I forgot to light the remembrance candle. How could I have missed so vital a ritual of love? With your picture fixed in the frame of my bedroom mirror, I see your unaging face next to my own each time I comb my graying hair. Or look up in the dresser drawer where just today I found the stockings borrowed on my last visit, knowing you were dying there in the desert, knowing I could never get them back. Friend, listener, sister, if only I could concentrate still embedded sparks of your vibrancy from the dusty corners of where we laughed together to incarnate your presence here with me. No remembrances, candles then, no regrets for my forgetting. For each other, we were satin-finished steel when we needed metal, river when we needed tears, breeze when we needed breath. Who said the bonds of blood are strongest? So tonight, I light a late candle, burning all night for all that is too late at the end of December. End of the year, beginning of a millennium, I wondered if I would live long enough to see. Thornton Wilder believed immortality endures in the memories of the dead the living carry with them. I carry you with me, long past every December. And finally, you. The streets are lacquered with frozen rain so sheer one can easily underestimate its obstinacy and potential to impair. Youth is slippery, so we spread salt on its boundaries and then regret the melting. The past, too, is slick. Since I last thought of you, the glaze of your face has flaked away with yesterday's skin, yet sometimes, when I'm suspended in the deepest vault of sleep, my automatic fingers etch the darkness with the diamond of your name. Thank you. So, let me just say first, I'm very proud of my wife who is featuring this morning. And just to give you a taste, this is one of her poems that I have put to music. So it's our first real you know, husband-wife collaboration. So this is called, you call it Moonbeams or Full Moon at Midnight? I call it Full Moon at Midnight, you call it Moonbeams. The poem is Moonbeams. The song is Full Moon at Midnight. <laughs> I'm kicking bits of moonbeams from the floor That seem to scamp and scurry under doors and spill from leaky windows down the hall in places where they shouldn't be at all I know it's hard to tame such wild things but who knows such tiny wings The ones that flutter in and catch my eyes And take my heart so fully by surprise In through my window on 
to silent flows Leave me in a brighter state of mind And grant a fullness of a different Carefully, I sit and juggle words. Try this one here. Will that one fit in there? No, there? No. Would another do as well or better? Should I rearrange a bit or start again, perhaps? A lost child playing jacks beside the pit of hell. I reconstruct the fact. If I play word games long enough, I may not need to act. This one's an invitation. Come spring, the lust within me grows to trust a thing of paper, sticks, and string to wind and sky. The air is warm, the sun is bright, and over new green fields the wind blows free. Come, share my appetite, forget your cares, come now and fly a kite with me. This is called Mike Talks to Abe, and Abe is my grandson. He begins to tell about fishing, how they'll do that together. Then he thinks, wait, I have to tell him what a fish is, mm -hmm. a large mouth with flesh behind it, a stretch of muscle spangled with scales, and about water, where you swam, little fish, before we all welcomed you into the air. It will take some time to make sense of boats, how things fall through water, how water can be death. But a fish hovers like magic, and a boat settles onto the water like a body on a bed, part in part over. He falls silent. Abe is sleeping again, a warm weight on his chest. Suddenly, now he's a father, life is more complicated than he, too, sleeps. She looks into a mirror, sees 
sees a haunted face How did such a beauty come to such disgrace Keeping to her promise after all these years In sickness and in health and in danger and in fear Leave the castle bell Get out while you can All your love for him Hasn't made the beast a man Leave the castle Get out while you can All your kindness and forgiveness Cannot make the beast a man not to blame for the hurt and shame it is not you who failed there's a love that can make a beast a man only in fairy tales She goes and gets a camera, points it at her face. She wants a good reminder of this time and place to carry in her suitcase to show her what is true. Even if he vows to change, she knows what to do. Leave the castle bell. Get out you can all your love for him hasn't made the beast a man leave the castle get out while you can all your kindness and forgiveness cannot make the beast a man one uh, it's called the revolution uh, from a little relationship I had in San Francisco a couple years back I'm returning to San Francisco and I'm scared there's a price on my head for all the times I've been there with you as collaborator I found you on my first raid and so confessing pressed my lonely blade to your throat in that North Beach summer heat I saw your flag was different your God, your eyes. I needed to conquer your country. I had to have your flag as a sheet and to carve my name into your sacred flesh. I loved you, I loved, but your English became too sharp. There were those meetings held in secret cellars in ancient tongues. I smelled overthrow. I fled into exile, bowing, I shall return, but your underground became too strong. They elected you queen and showered oblations. Why didn't they shave your head? Why weren't you cast out for your treason? Were you in league with them all along, or did I cause you suffering? There are statues of you, plaques in the city square. I can't get an audience, for there is that price on my head. I still have that tattered flag on my bed. You can't have that back, ever. The revolution will have to do without. I'm returning to San Francisco. I am older now. Perhaps I won't be spotted. Thank you. Skin. 
Sitting quietly, attentive to life, watching, listening, taking it in. The sky air so blue, the trees gentle rustling, watching, listening, taking it in. Moment to moment, life in the present, watching, listening, taking it in. Thank you. stay with me we can go on come and have your sweet way with me don't let me think you're gone dear life oh how you distracted me time time again Night and day you attracted me like it would never end But now you're bloodless and strange As if you'd gone under the knife Don't give up the ghost, don't change I'm struggling for you I think I know what you want of me 
take me leave but some quantity something that will not die It's called Equinox Seeds. Gushing waters sparkle like an emerging Venus. My path winds by cedar boughs bending, protecting baby shoots. Fire's first kiss, sunrise song and wind, speaks promise. Earth's womb opens, worms wiggle, crows gather. Equinox arrives ready for winter's seeds. My excitement, anticipation builds. My seed bundle is full. This year I plant my winter harvest joyously, sitting on soft mosses by gurgling waters, placing the future life down deep. Earth Mother has called me home. And the song is called I'm Only Human. and lace and pearls never to be me but sometimes I am a devil and I dress in red and black and I'll run straight down that road to hell never coming back never coming back never coming back
Thanks a lot. Surgery. 